It's a delight to be here today with Professor Justin Cammy, who is director of the program in Jewish Studies at Smith College, where he's associate professor of Jewish Studies and Comparative Literature, and also a member of the programs in Russian and East European Studies and Middle East Studies. And we're going to talk today about that last subject. Thanks for taking time today. <laughs> Great to be in sunny Arizona. Thank you. <laughs> So to jump right in, um, your work primarily is, uh, is in research on, on Yiddish. And I wonder, why are you interested in this topic of how we teach of uh, Israel and Judaism on campus? And how did you get involved in that? And how does that complement your, your Yiddish studies? Well, it's a great uh, question. I, I benefit from the fact that I was hired to be a Jewish studies professor, not a to specific subfield within right. Jewish studies. Yeah. So I have great, the, I, I, one of the great things about teaching undergraduates at a liberal arts college is that you can, can teach fairly much what you want as long yeah. as you have the training to do so. And it always seemed to be uh, generative in the most profound way to spend part of my intellectual energy in research and teaching working on the world of Eastern Europe, the world of Yiddish, uh, the world of Jewish literature at its sort of most um, ripe and most interesting as far as I, as far as, you know, I believe, uh, but also at the same time to look at the Jewish world now and all of its most interesting uh, both challenges and accomplishments. And to me, I think that w what you do is when you only teach Yiddish without also teaching about Zionism and Israel, is you replicate older problems that, that, uh, between Hebrew and Yiddish mm -hmm. and between Zionists and socialists and communists. And I think all of those things are old. They're, they're sort of old. We need to get over them. Mm -hmm. that, that many Yiddish writers both wrote in Yiddish and Hebrew. Many people who spoke Hebrew also came from Yiddish-speaking families. Mm -hmm. So this idea that you can see the world, the Jewish world, by either past or present or even into the future through only one language or through only one experience, mm -hmm. either through the diaspora or through homecoming, seems to me to be incredibly odd and old-fashioned. Mm -hmm. So the ability to, in one semester right now, mm -hmm. I'm teaching a class on Yiddish literature, uh, sort of a survey of Yiddish literature on the, in the Soviet Union, uh, in Poland, uh, in the Americas, and I'm also teaching a course on the, uh, I guess for, for better, to the Arab-Israeli conflict nowadays, sometimes better known as the Palestine-Israel conflict. And in every year, I always try to have at least one course uh, on Israel. So that can be something on conflict, but I think that if we only teach conflict in the same way that if we only teach Holocaust or anti-Semitism, our way of thinking about Jewish studies can become skewed. So I'll always have something on mm -hmm. um, Yiddish and something on Israel. Sometimes it'll be on conflict, but next year, for instance, I'll teach something on the Arab, uh, on a... Uh, uh, what is it? History of Israel. Yeah. Uh, and then I'll also teach a class on literatures of Zionism and contemporary Hebrew hmm. literature. And I think also that's combined with making sure that when available, you can actually direct students to having on-site experiences. Hmm. So whether that be through my work teaching Yiddish literature in Israel, which itself is a really interesting yeah conceptual sort of uh, challenge that also I, I find fascinating. And I do that every summer. So bringing students to Israel to learn Yiddish uh, or bringing students to Israel, which I've done to study Israeli history, culture, uh, Hebrew, and all those other things I find fascinating. So to me, they're, they're totally complementary. And those who want to divide them, it doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. And, and also it's my interest. I think that not, not tying yourself in some way um, to where half the world's Jewish population is and trying to understand where that community in all of its diversity mm -hmm. is coming from. I don't see how you could be a responsible right. teacher or at least in my case, director of a Jewish studies program. Very interesting. So there's many perceptions uh, among the broader Jewish community about what happens in these types of classes. But when just looking at the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, right. what do you see as, what are the most common conceptual obstacles that students have uh, when grappling with this? Um, well, some of them uh, very easily come to mind because we've been grappling with them all semester. Yeah. So uh, one has to do with the misunderstanding or the misperception that Jews are a faith community. Mm -hmm. Sort of coming down from a sort of Protestant mm -hmm. understanding that who are the Jews? The Jews are like Christians or Muslims or other religious groups yeah. in America right. who are a faith community. And faith communities, religious communities, don't have states of their own. Right. So I'll oftentimes get, uh, I don't understand from students, I don't understand why the Jews need a country of their own, their religion. Mm -hmm. And you can sort of, even, even with that, you can mm -hmm. push back and say, well, you know, there's a lot of countries that are 
Muslim countries or yeah. Arab countries that have a majority Muslim population in which Islam is at least part of the um, political culture, if not the official language. Yeah. Do you have a problem with that? Or there are a lot of Christian countries in the world that you may not think of as Christian, but either they're majoritarian Christian or, you know, the Queen of England mm -hmm. is, is also the head of the Anglican Church. Yeah. So they sort of pause and it never occurred to them because they're coming from an American frame. But I think they don't understand that Jews are a people. They don't understand that Jewish peoplehood and perhaps Jewish religion uh, occurred at the same time or, or can't be disentangled in the way that modernity and the Enlightenment attempted to do that. So they don't understand that. They don't understand Zionism mm -hmm. from beginning to end. They don't understand. Yeah. They're very suspicious of ideology, mm -hmm. this generation. Uh, they're very suspicious of anything that somehow speaks of nationalism. Mm -hmm. uh, and they, they think that all national, I mean, these are generalities, yes, right, right? Right. Right. very, very smart, right. sensitive, intuitive yeah. students. Right. Uh, but many students struggle with whether nationalism or national identity can ever be good. Right. Uh, not only in its most extreme varieties, mm -hmm. but can can there be a nationalism that is, um, you know, positive for a community? Mm -hmm. So this is something that they struggle with. Obviously, they struggle with big issues that are at the heart of the conflict, the question of colonialism. Uh, they struggle conceptually, uh, I think, with mapping the, context, the, the conflict. Uh, even in their own minds, many of them come to this not knowing how big Israel is. They think it's a lot bigger than it is. They hear that it gets a lot of American aid. They hear that it's a very powerful country. And when you actually show them the maps, the first thing we do on the first day is show two different maps, or at least I present that. And, and I say that this might frame how you think of the conflict. If you show Israel in the context of a map of the broader uh, Muslim world, stretching from Morocco in the west all the way you know, past Iran uh, in the east, then Israel right in the middle of that um, seems to be one thing. If you only focus and show them the map of the map of Israel today, including um, the West Bank or Judea and Samaria right. or Palestine or whatever they, whatever they choose to right. talk, call it, right. then it looks very different. Right. So how you see the geography also influences how you think of the, right. the problem. Yeah. So all of these things are, are part of a larger yeah. issue that we're trying to struggle mm -hmm. with in sort of framing this, talking about it. And of course, whenever there's something that has to do with conflict or, or perceived conflict, it's really uh, a challenge to get students to speak in ways that can that can promote productive dialogue. Yeah. And that's what we really struggle with right. in class on a, on a fundamental level, to encourage students to speak their mind, mm -hmm. to allow them to yeah. make mistakes, yeah. to acknowledge that when a student says something, even if you feel offended, they may not have intended right. it, to offend you, right. right? They're trying to learn, they're trying to ask questions. Um, and to encourage a, a broad variety of voices, and at least in my case, to ensure that my own, as best we can, because we all clearly carry um, biases that are both conscious right. and unconscious, right. at least in my case, to create an environment where students who, who think that they disagree with me, because they, they may not know what I think on any right. one particular issue, feel free to not only challenge, challenge anything I say, right. but to forcefully Challenge that. Yeah, I wish I could take these and, and, and know that yeah. they're not going to like, you know, know that as long as they have facts and an argument that seems reason, they, that, that yeah. reasonable, well minded yeah. people can disagree about things. That's amazing. I, 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 I wish I could have <laughs> taken that class and still could. What do you think are some of the responsibilities of those who are teaching these, these courses? Well, to go back to what I just said, that would be that would be one of them. Yeah. I actually, my own little one, and I, yeah. you know, I wouldn't want to speak for all colleagues, but I do think that in. I think there's a difference between people who are well-read yeah. and educated and perhaps have a position of teaching in a college or university and people who have some degree of specialization in terms of their own experience and in their own reading. So for instance, you know, I can read the Washington Post or the New York Times every day. I, I, you know, I read what's going on in Russia, yeah. right? It would mm -hmm. never occur to me to teach a course on Russia mm -hmm. just because I've read about it. Right. At, because I haven't spent any time there. I don't know it inside out. So I think the first thing is for people teaching this conflict, they have to be willing to lean into it and put a lot, I think, of their personal time in being there, mm. talking to people, yes. spending time in Israel, spending time mm. in the Palestinian territories, talking to different groups, going to different neighborhoods that are outside of your conflict zone, uh, out of your comfort zone. Yeah. So oftentimes, I mean, my, my experience there goes back to when I was a mm -hmm. college student myself, now more than, I don't know, 30 years ago. And since then, 
I've done fellowships there. I've lived there. Yeah. I've been there almost every mm-hmm. summer. And every time I'm there, I'm trying to go to different neighborhoods, speak to different people, use what I recognize as my mm-hmm. privilege to be able to travel around in ways that even some Israelis and especially Palestinians can't travel. So mm-hmm. I will go whenever I'm there and spend a day walking around East Jerusalem mm-hmm. in places that most American Jewish tourists, let alone Israelis, don't go. Or go to Hebron, or go to Ramallah, or yeah. go meet colleagues at yeah. Al-Quds University uh, in East Jerusalem, or go to Nablus. All of these things, it's not about whether what I'm hearing is something that I agree mm-hmm. with or not, or what I'm seeing is something mm-hmm. that I agree with or not. It's having the responsibility to say that I have been, I have seen, I have talked, I have listened, I have processed. Yeah. So I think it's important for people, not only professors and academics, but anyone in the community, if you're going to speak on an issue, you need to be able to speak about it with some degree of of um, personal experience in an ongoing. Obviously, yeah. people who teach ancient Greece, you're not going to go back right. to ancient Greece. Right. Right? That's, right. An impo- that's impossible. Right. Right. But we're talking about something that, that's still there. Yeah. So I think that that's a huge responsibility for people. The other responsibility is just to recognize where one is coming from, right? Yeah. Right. You know, I, I come from a certain community, from a certain perspective, from a certain degree of commitments. Uh, Should one state one's bias to the, to the cause or not needed? It's interesting. A lot of the, there's, there's a lot of debate about this or over whether you should sort of try to pretend that you're totally neutral and have the students sort of guessing right. what you think or whether you should be quite clear yeah. about it. I think that for me, and I can only speak for, for myself, I, I'm not particularly eager to create syllabi that promote a certain perspective. So I have to try to have a lot of different perspectives on the syllabus. But I think it's also important that students recognize that anyone that they're learning from is a human being with a certain yeah, series right. of commitments and hopes. Right. And then I think that outside of the class, after the class, there may be other. But I'm, I'm quite careful. When I'm teaching this course, I'm not particularly posting um, online uh, on this issue. I'm not going out giving a lot of sort of uh, talks on mm. what I personally wow. Wow. Uh, believe about this. Interesting. Um, because I think then you can, it's already wow. raw. Yeah, and sensitive yeah. enough that I want the students to be able to, I don't, I want them not only to, to listen, but to hear. Yeah. And wow. what if, if a student comes in feeling already sort of with their backup that I'm taking this course because I'm interested in it, but yeah. you know, the professor yeah. already thinks something, right. whether it be, it could be a Jewish professor who doesn't yeah. like Israel. Right. And the students, you know, the, right. some Jewish students might, uh, or it could be a, a professor who's seen to be, you know, completely Zionist, or mm-hmm. it could be just someone who's, you know, not Jewish, not Palestinian, not Arab, knows no real skin in the game, but right. ultimately right. Um, is interested in it. Or, of course, it could be a Palestinian, or it could be uh, an Arab or a Muslim teacher. All of these people are going to have their yeah. own um, identities. The question is, can, can one teach this in a way that allows on the syllabus? My voice is only one voice. That's mm-hmm. the way I see it. Mm-hmm. The, way, the, way, the way you construct a syllabus mm-hmm. are the other voices. Yes. So you have right. the, the teacher's voice. Right. Then you have the student voices. Yeah. But those readings yeah. are all highly curated yeah. in order to create a certain number of voices or perspectives that perhaps yeah. you don't have, you don't represent, but you think are important. Yeah. So we'll, we'll put those on. Yeah. So, you know, it's, I commonly hear in Jewish communal circles that... Um, Jewish students on our campuses today are flooded and bombarded with um, um, anti-Israel professors, anti-Israel students, anti-Israel uh, funding and groups, and are really bullied and completely overwhelmed as Jewish students on campus. Right. And I wonder, does, does, that, per, does that picture um, reflect the reality that you see and that you, when you talk to colleagues on other campuses around America that mm-hmm. they see as well? Right. Um, I think it's very uh, local yeah. and very specific. And I also think it depends on who's there yeah. at any one time. So oftentimes people will say, you know, you'll read the reports from various uh, Jewish communal institutions yeah. that talk about sort of this school is an anti-Israel school. The school itself... Right is neither here nor there, right? right? right. The school itself is made up of those who are there at any one time. So if you have a certain number of very committed, uh, I don't like to use the words pro-Israel or pro palestine but if you have have a lot of students who are interested in joining groups like uh, uh, Students for Justice in Palestine, or uh, if not now, then it's going to be more active. If you have fewer, then it's going to be less. So it's not about the institution, it's about who's there at any one Mm -hmm. uh, moment. I think, it's, I think it is tough for students to navigate this world, but I also think that a lot of students 
come out of their yeah. home communities without necessarily having the preparation to articulate what they believe and why they believe and also to recognize that sometimes you're not going to be able to convince those mm -hmm. who may not agree with you and to just know what you stand for. Mm -hmm. So I think that's really important, sort of, that you, you can't have these, the world out there is not always going to conform to the way mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you see the world. Yeah. Uh, and you just have to know what you believe, yeah. who you are, what yeah. you think is important, right. hold your head high. Yeah. Now, does that mean that there, sometimes things don't go overboard? Of course, but I think that there, we have to do a better job in our communities doing uh, a lot better work distinguishing between registers of anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism and not allowing all the time one to bleed into the other. Mm -hmm. There are long histories of Jewish anti-Zionisms. I make it very clear that being anti-Zionist in 1920, when most of the Jewish world didn't live in Israel, mm -hmm. is very different than being mm -hmm. anti-Zionist in 2019. Yeah, actually, so that's, so that's actually the last question yeah. I want to ask you here is, how, how does your study of Yiddish and of European, earlier mm -hmm. European Jewish culture in the 18th, 19th century influence the way you think of the relationship between anti-Zionism and anti-Israel today? Well, I, I think that it allows me to have a broader historical perspective yeah. to be able to communicate to students because I, I get a lot, I get wonderful students uh, and the students who come to Smith are of a wide variety of political perspectives, uh, but they might be a little bit less, they, be, like, they might be more liberal, more progressive than, than the national right. average. I, I can't say because I don't do surveys of them, yeah. but I think it's important for Jewish students at this very formative age, 18, to, to find their Jewish address. And I see my job is to help them find that address, even if it doesn't correspond to my own personal life choices. And one of the things that my study of Eastern European Jewry and Yiddish teaches, well, there's a lot of lessons. One is, is, it, is this history that Zionism was one of many different ideologies that attracted to the Jews, right? So if you're at the end of the 19th century, what are all the options that you can have uh, right. in life? Well, some of them, one of them might be Zionism, right. but many more people might be choosing an, the non-ideological option of America, right? right? right. You know? uh, some people might be running towards radicalism, anarchism, and communism. Other people are saying Jewish life needs to remain where the Jews are in Eastern Europe, and they become part of uh, bun Bundism, which essentially is a uh, Jewish national form of socialism and, and a workers' party. Uh, n most of these were not necessarily, and in some cases explicitly, not Zionist. Yeah. But those people had very firm senses of who they were as Jews. And to say that all of those people at those times, because they weren't Zionists, were anti-Semites mm -hmm. or self-hating, I think is problematic. Mm -hmm. Could some of them have been wrong? Absolutely. Right. Uh, did they know they were going to be wrong? No. Yeah. Uh, can we learn certain lessons? about how certain assumptions they made might have led to certain tragic mistakes in Jewish history? Of course. Yeah. But I think it's really important to have a longer historical mm -hmm. sense, mm -hmm. to understand that there is a long history of non-Zionism or anti-Zionism within the Jewish world. Yeah. Now, is that something that I'm promoting? Don't I yeah. say, because right. this existed right. then, right. you should be this right. now? Right. No. Yeah. But I think that there are ways to, everyone moves at, a, at, a, yeah. at an appropriate developmental stage. And it, once you spend enough time around young people, you realize that just because as parents, we might have certain commitments, when you send a young person off to college, it's a time for them to find themselves. Mm -hmm. And the best way to ensure that they reject something is to insist right. that, that they have to replicate who you are. Right. Um, so you want to, you know, you want to set themselves up. You want to set themselves up for success before they leave, so they have a certain basic Jewish literacy, yeah. and also perhaps even a certain Zionist literacy. And we can define Zionism, you know, through a whole spectrum, mm -hmm. um, from very, very far left by national forms of Zionism that existed historically, all the way um, to right wing uh, manifestations of Zionism. And they need to know that there's a long history. So we go back to the question you asked: What are some of the conceptual problems? that we face in, in my course as well. One of them is this definition of Zionism and how open it is historically, that when they hear the word Zionism, they may have a certain idea of what that is, yeah. but they don't, they don't really. Mm -hmm. And I would say most of us don't really. Yeah. They, they would it takes a lot of reading to understand how diverse a movement this was. And to give an example, like there, were, there were certain kibbutzim in Israel that were Stalinist kibbutzim. How is that possible? Right? If Stalin was against right. the Jewish homeland, right. and right. if Zionism was for it, how could you have agricultural Zionist settlements who might have at a certain point 
still been in, in that camp. Yeah. Well, that's right. complicated. Right. And it takes time yeah. to sort of uh, yeah. unpeel that. But I think in the end of the day, one of the, one of the to go back to sort of this question of, of sort of Zionism, anti-Zionism, safe, uh, whether campuses are safe for Jewish students, it all depends on the responsibility of the characters at play, right? Yeah. If you're there to actually have a conversation, then I think those things are legitimate. But a lot of these events that occur on campuses are not really there for ideas. They're yeah. sort of, they promote a litmus <coughs> test yeah. uh, that say, you, 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 Jews are welcome, of course, so long as you check your Zionism at the door. Mm -hmm. And to me, that sort of that, 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 that right. uh, on a personal level, that, that, that is a, a total difference. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I think that also, I recognize that a part, when I'm not in the classroom, and I sort of represent just being a faculty at the college, yeah. <coughs> we're all addresses for different types of students. And I'll have students come in and ask all right. types of questions. And right. there we can be much more um, open, I think, yeah. about... Um, Encouraging them to pursue their own dreams yeah. and, and sort of sort of what they think. So all you know, if students they, uh, when, when they want to study abroad, I'll say, well, these are your options. You want to study in Israel? Great. This is where I think it would be great to study. Yeah. If they say, I don't want to study in Israel, great. I have a whole other menu of options. Yeah. As long as they're right. investing, yeah. I think eventually that investment pays off on the other side. None of us are the same as we were at 18, 19, or 20 year old. Uh, 20 years old. My, commit, my, my, my politics are different. Yeah. My commitments uh, have shifted. Uh, and, you know, it's just something that we need to get used to. Yeah. Uh, but I don't want to underplay it. Yeah. I mean, I think that there are manifestations <coughs> of this on campus um, that we need to keep our eye on. But, and, and I think institutionally within, mm -hmm. we need to do a better job sometimes of creating those environments among ourselves. It's not always helpful to have outsiders mm -hmm. come in with either threats or um, promises of exposure mm -hmm. online. Uh, I think because there, there is something called academic freedom. Yeah. And oftentimes that's as the line between academic freedom and, and, and bias is as confusing sometimes as the line between um, whether something that may not necessarily paint Israel in the most positive life like is necessarily anti-Semitic. So you're saying, so you're saying it might actually be hurting the cause more than helping when outside groups kind of fly in. Yeah, I mean, it, I, I think it depends on it because the, it get, then it gets not only the students that backs mm -hmm. up, but the institutions yeah. uh, back up. So right. I think we have to be very careful about allowing a lot. And I think we have, we, we have to allow students oftentimes to make mistakes. It's very different. My standards right. for what I expect of, of adults yeah. are different than my standards of students. Right. right. Because I think that students, they're there to learn and to yeah. test out ideas, right. even ideas that I might know, you know, in the back of my mind, yeah. I, may not, I may not believe <laughs> in, but they're there and right. there needs to be a space for that. Yeah, right. In terms of sort of what we can expect of adults, that's very different. Yeah. And that sometimes becomes the... Yeah. the Fascinating. Well, yeah. the students are very lucky to have you. I'm lucky to have them. <laughs> <laughs> Check out the writings of Professor Justin Cammy, and we will have two other podcasts coming up soon from his lectures. Thanks so much. Enjoy.